The National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges celebrates, promotes, and honors the diversity reflected in the communities that we serve. We are committed to advancing diversity, ensuring equity, expanding inclusion, and supporting justice in all aspects of our work. We share our stories to explain our mission and to encourage you to make your stories part of our own. We asked a few members of NCJFCJ to reflect on diversity, equity, and inclusion and what it means to them. I believe the council defines diversity as a group of judges or attorneys, our membership being different people with different experiences who may look different from each other, but really coming together for a common purpose. Making sure that we have adequate representation in terms of race, ethnicity, national origin, gender, gender identity, gender expression, sexual orientation, age, also disability status and religion. I also think that the council is defining diversity as well in terms of culture and the way that families are structured and how families see the task of taking care of and raising children and parenting. The reality is we have been for too long too many white men in one organization being judges. For us it's a call to action. So when we're talking about diversity and inclusion. We're talking about using everybody's talent and bringing everything good out of individuals in a place where they feel like they can triumph. I would start with the word intentional. You have to be intentional if you're going to address systemic change. And by intentional, I mean we look at our policies and procedures inside the organization our policies and procedures for the board of directors and who we try to promote. People being included at the table, invited to the table, but not just sitting at the table, but actually feeling like they can be part of the conversation. It's incredibly important that children and families see a bench and be exposed to a bench that looks like them in every sense of the word, not just in terms of their skin color, but in terms of their ethnicity, sexual orientation, uh, culture, experience, etc. It's all about fairness, I think, and it's all about understanding and respect, and consequently, judges, I think, have to be very aware of biases and understandings of different cultures. We have to address the race and equity issue if we are gonna live true to our needs and the needs of families that all children, all families, are given the opportunity to make important changes in their lives, regardless of their neighborhood that they grew up in, their background, and their circumstances. We want uh, people to understand they can come to NCJ, FCJ, and feel welcome, and, and we're helping courts and judicial systems, you know, not just across America, but all across the world. And so we want uh, people to feel comfortable with working with us as well. I've been thrilled to hear about all of the diversity initiatives with the NCJ, FCJ. I believe that we're being very strategic and very mindful and intentional in making sure that we're having a membership that reflects the people that we serve. We are raising our level of awareness, raising our level of consciousness, and deliberately, consciously choosing to keep an eye on diversity and to be more inclusive, not just in terms of membership, or board composition, but also just in terms of the programming we do, the educating we do, and how we see the issues that we care about. We push so that institutions that are part of the legal system as a whole respect diversity and are aware of the need for inclusion. I'm proud of the fact that the council has decided that this should be our number one strategic action plan. We have been struggling with this issue for probably six or eight years, and I think over the last three years we've made a concerted effort to really focus and make it not one of our priorities, but the priority. Well, we've taken a deep dive and a really hard look into our own demographics as a council and then to the demographics of the judiciary and the folks who work with the judiciary across the United States. When it comes to our partnerships, you we're expecting, first of all, those that deal with the council to have equally high ideals, and not just in actuality, not just in theory in aligning ourselves with organizations that are also committed to those goals. If you bring different faces and voices to the table, you get a richer mixture of opinion and intelligence and knowledge. Our perspective is 
every decision we make, every layer of our organization, from our staff to how we work out in the field, that has to be an element of what we do. I think that this combined focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion will bring another way for us to come together and really galvanize on that and take it even a step further. Internally, it means that the, the agency, the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges, also has to walk of the talk. I really look forward to the day when we move this from a goal to a reality. My wife went to pick up our daughter at her school. She came out crying. Uh, my daughter and I speak in Spanish. So she's aware that I have a different cultural background, that we have a different cultural background. When my wife asked why she was crying, she said that other students were saying that I was going to go away. She goes to a heavily immigrant school, but it's not just people from Latin American countries. There are people from Africa, there are people from Asia. So the concern was across immigrant communities not just one. Subsequently, as we dig deeper into the situation, it turned out that the children had gotten together as second graders without any prompting, without any adult involvement, and identified which houses were safe houses that children whose parents were sent away could go to and find refuge. So children that age were incredibly aware and courageous to take things into their hands to help each other out, knowing that not everybody was in the same space. I remember one time I did have a young adult, we were talking on the phone, he was on runaway, and I was trying to get him just to come back to court. And we talked on the phone a couple of times, and when he finally came into court, he looked at me and he said, you don't look like what I thought you looked like. And I told him, well, you don't look like what I thought you'd look like either, but it's a pleasure to meet you. And it was a really wonderful kind of relationship that we were able to build, uh, even just with little comments like that and being open to each other. I really didn't know what I wanted to do when I grew up as a junior in high school, you know, far shot from growing up. And I asked our, our guidance counselor, and she says, well, the tests show that uh, you have great uh, manual dexterity, you have great mechanical skills, you know, based on all of the results of the test, you know, I believe that it would be good for you to think about being a plumber or a mechanic. And it made me angry, quite frankly, because I knew some of my classmates who didn't do as well as I did academically were being encouraged, oh, you need to be thinking about going on college tours and thinking about where you're going to go and where you're going to attend they didn't happen to be people of color. So I'm a little girl in the Dominican Republic, and I'm living a really happy life. I've got many sisters, I've got a great life, and suddenly I'm not with my mom, I'm not with my dad, I'm with my older sister, and my family is dispersed across the country. I don't know what's going on when I'm a little kid, but what's happening is my father's got himself into some issues with Trujillo in the Dominican Republic. So he has to make a choice. To live, he has to leave the country. But he leaves the country without us, okay? And then there's a whole process of us then coming to the United States with him. But when I was in eighth grade, I had a social studies teacher tell me that I could not be a judge in the midst of a, a class assignment. Um, I wanted to be certain, play a certain role, and he said, you can't be that, you can't be that, and you'll never be a judge. And why would he even tell me that, as opposed to anyone else in my class, stuck with me. So in eighth grade, I knew at that moment what I wanted to do. And that's the story I tell when I go out and speak to kids all the time. Don't let anyone tell you what you cannot do or what you cannot be. And so when I go out, just recently, I was at a school and I took my robe and I was speaking about things. And I let the kids put on my robe and hold my gavel and take some pictures. And they were just amazed, like, wow, you know, a real judge. And that's very empowering for children. We are actually changing things, not only internally with staff, with our approach to recruitment to the council and to members. We're making it happen. And that's uh, the most important thing, I think, about what the council's doing on this issue.
NCJS DJ allows me to, to sit back and, and think and see what's the, you know, what's the best options uh, you know, for the court? What can we do as a judicial system to help these families? So I decided to go to these conferences because I know I'm going to learn something and then I'm going to be able to take back to, uh, to our court in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and be able to use uh, to the good of uh, improving the lives of, of children and families. We look at our staff our hiring practices, our training methodology, how do we do that so that we ensure that we're sensitive to those issues and we manage it properly. That I've taken back to my court, to my county, and how we do things. For me, the training has helped me to open up my eyes and seek opportunities to work on matters where people not like me are the people that are receiving the service. We had a a trauma review of our courthouse starting from the parking lot, moving through the courthouse, moving into the courtrooms to make sure that we were thoughtful about what this family is coming from, making sure that they don't, aren't shamed in our courtroom. I mean, it's a difficult place to be. People that are coming to the courthouse, to the juvenile courthouse, are coming there generally because of a very challenging time in their life. And I think we have to have sympathy and understand that, as well as trying to make sure that we are appropriate in our response. If you are going to be pursuing this opportunity to treat all families and all children in an equitable way across the country, it's really important that our staff, our researchers, and our administrators understand the value of this purpose and the value that they um, can give to us judges across the country when we are addressing this issue in our particular communities. We do see a lot of uh, trainings. Obviously, when you talk about implicit biases and things like that, it's never uh, just enough to be aware of it. You really have to understand it. My hiring decisions were very, very intentional which frankly has been informed by my work with the National Council over the last 15, 18 years. They really gave me some tools and some ideas on how to be intentional, diversifying my staff, and I'm proud of that. I think just by being on the bench is very impactful. When children see someone that looks like them being on the bench or doing something that they never thought about doing, it makes it seem possible and it makes it seem achievable, which I think is significant. It's important to go out and speak to youth because I don't think that they think about being a lawyer, being a doctor, being somebody of influence. It's important for us as individuals, as professionals, and as leaders to try to get other people to think of themselves that way. I think sharing with the children that you can be a lawyer, you can be a judge, that it's not some unattainable, far-reaching, way-out thing, which I think a lot of people feel. Being a minority judge and a female judge, some of them connect with me differently than they may with some of my colleagues. However, with a better understanding, I think that all of us can reach our litigants better. In my court, we always, our thing is meet them where they are because you can't imprint your experience, your socioeconomic, your race, your gender on someone else. You have to meet them where they are. I take every single opportunity to tell a young attorney, a young person who's interested in the law, who may not have ever thought about taking the path to the judiciary, that they too can be a judge because I never know who it's really gonna spark motivation in, but we definitely need more diversity and the more I can spread that encouragement, the better I think we'll be as a community and as a country. Change doesn't come quickly. It's slow, particularly when you're talking about changing systems. It's important for us to give profound thought to what it means to have racial equity, to be inclusive of those who are different from who we are, and to be encouraging, to be exhorters of positive rather than judgmental and discouraging people, if not with words, certainly by our conduct and the attitudes that we convey to folks. I know this endeavor for progressive approaches to making sure we're being inclusive and we're demanding race equity in our profession and the way that we work is a 
big, big goal and a big task to take on. But I think organizations like this doing that and making it a priority is setting an example that hopefully a lot of other people will follow. Just look up in CJFCJ, involved with the court system in your city, your state, you know, give us a call. Uh, there's a, a variety of different things that we can, we can do to help. Come join up uh, and, and, and help us as we improve the lives as well as your court system.